In the winter of 1998, Alan and Helen Smith were excited about moving into a new home just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. We had two children, Taylor, who was seven at the time, and Millage was about six months old. Helen had her hands full caring for the children, while Alan spent his days focused on his graduate school studies. Helen was often left at home taking care of the kids all by herself. Then we got a huge surprise. I was shocked to discover that I was pregnant with my third child. I was concerned because I was already extremely busy with the two of them. Once the shock wore off, we began preparation and planning for a, a baby girl. On October 5th in 1998, I went into labor. We arrived at the hospital at around 11 o'clock, and by 11.21, Julia was born. Her delivery was much quicker than any of my previous deliveries. My doctor immediately handed her to me. She had all 10 fingers, all 10 toes. She looked perfect. But as I was looking at Julia, I noticed that she had some little purple polka dots on her face, her neck and her torso. It looked like she had blueberries sprinkled all over her. And then when I turned Julia over, I immediately noticed that she had bruises from the base of her neck all the way down to the tip of her bottom. We were very concerned at this point. We could not believe what we were seeing. Alarmed, Helen and Alan asked the doctor why Julia has the strange marks. He explained at that time that it's not unusual for there to be some birth trauma uh, to the newborn through the birth canal. He said she shot out like a rocket, and so she must have bumped her back along the way. The doctors weren't concerned about the bruising, and we were discharged and, and sent home. For the next couple of weeks, she was doing well. All the bruising along her back seemed to be healing correctly. But it's not long before Helen notices a frightening new development. When Julia was three weeks old, I was going to change her diapers, and as I was doing so, I noticed that she had what looked like fingerprint bruises along her torso and her rib cage area. And that was quite frightening. I had never seen anything like that on any babies before. I, I figured out the only way she could have gotten those was just from me picking her up. I knew I had not handled her roughly at all. I knew that something was really wrong with Julia. Because I was in Birmingham, 30 miles away, I urged Helen to take Julia to the pediatrician close to our home. I was concerned that perhaps we were dealing with something more than just birth trauma. The doctor wanted to know if anybody in our family bruised easy, and I told him that I did have a history of bruising easily. He kind of just explained it away as she probably just inherited that from me and, you know, just be a little more careful. He didn't seem to be concerned because everything else about her seemed to be normal. And I believed him. He was the doctor. But just a week later, while Helen is bathing Julia, she sees something that stops her in her tracks. I noticed that she had a small circular bruise on the bottom of her foot. As I continued to bathe her, I noticed that she had a similar looking bruise inside of her ear. I thought that was very odd because she was not walking or even crawling yet. Determined to find out what's wrong with her newborn, Helen contacts a new pediatrician. He examined Julia and ordered a blood test. He was checking for her platelet count to check for some of the more easily recognized blood issues that children are born with. The doctor suspects Julia might have idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, a disorder in which the body doesn't produce enough platelets, a type of blood cell essential to the clotting process. Waiting was hard. I just wanted some answers. But the results came back, and he told me she checked out fine. 
Julia's platelet count was normal. He seemed to feel that Helen might be overreacting. He told me I had a case of new mom nerves, but Julia wasn't my first baby. I had two other children who never had any of these problems. I was a little bit frustrated by being dismissed so easily by her pediatrician. At that point, didn't know what else I could do other than really try to protect Julia a little bit more. So every place that she was in the home, her crib, her baby carrier, her car seat, I just made sure that there was extra padding. I would strap her into the car seat and then I would roll up a blanket and I would kind of wrap it around her from the, the arms all the way around her head and tuck it down on either side. And then I repeated the process all around her feet so that she pretty much had a, a tube of blankets encircling her in her car seat. I did that just to make sure there was no way that her body was coming in contact to any hard surface. I doubled up on the bumpers on her crib and felt assured that that would give her the extra protection in her crib. I was always very careful to swaddle Julia. Uh, like Again, I doubled up on blankets because the thought of me putting bruises on her w was upsetting and, and I wanted to make sure that, that there was nothing I was doing that was causing her any kind of injury or pain. I pretty much treated Julia as if she were a very fragile egg. If I could have bubble wrapped her, I would have. The hardest part was to keep her 16-month-old brother from accidentally injuring her. I kept thinking if simple act of me holding her gently would cause bruises, um, what, what would happen if he accidentally hit her with a toy? It was difficult because it was an unnatural feeling to keep siblings apart and he was so curious about his new baby sister. Over the next few months, Julia hits all her milestones right on target. But the more active she becomes, the more she seems to be hurting herself. She started scooting around the floor and her knees and hands in particular always had bruises on them. She always had an average of at least 10 bruises on her body at this point. And, and we're talking about a five month old baby. I have a memory of looking at Julia one time and Helen and I commented she looks like a leopard because of her spots. But she did not appear to be in any distress at all. She was just happy little Julia, smiling through it. It was bizarre. Confused by it all, Helen grows even more worried after an unsettling incident at the supermarket. I remember this one lady, she started to approach our cart to go, oh, what a cute baby. Once she noticed Julia's bruises, she cut her eyes and gave me the meanest look and then just walked away. It was my light bulb moment where it occurred to me that people think I'm abusing my child. It just broke my heart. Since birth, Helen Smith's daughter Julia has been suffering from strange black and blue marks that seem to appear randomly all over her body. Frightened and not sure where to turn, Helen reaches out for support. She takes the children to visit her parents in Augusta, Georgia. I saw the bruises and I realized what Helen was going through. <laughs> Helen had described them, but seeing it in reality was very shocking. Probably about 60% of her body had bruises on it. Little do Ann and Helen realize the worst is yet to come for six-month-old Julia. Our very first night visiting my parents, I woke up to, to Julia's cries. I picked her up and felt that she was wet. And when I turned on the light, it was my worst nightmare. It was a scene out, out of a horror story. Her hair was matted with blood. Her whole face was covered in blood. Her clothes were completely saturated. I was terrified. As we cleaned her up, we couldn't find the source until we got the very last speck of blood off of her face. And all of that blood came from a tiny nick that she had caused with a fingernail on her face. We got to the emergency room and the doctor examined Julia. We were hoping someone could give us some answers. He did a general examination. He listened to her history of everything we had gone through 
and suspected that she more than likely had a bleeding disorder called von Willebrand's, and he ordered blood tests. Von Willebrand disease is a common blood disorder in which the body lacks an important clotting factor. It is easily managed and treatable with medication. I just needed to find out what was going on. And so I kind of was hoping that that's what it was. The not knowing of exactly what you're dealing with is so hard. Two long hours later, the doctor returns with the test results. He came back and said, well, no, it's not von Willebrand's. Her hemoglobin's good, everything's fine. I, I don't know what it is, but it's definitely not von Willebrand's. So it left us with no answers whatsoever. Helen was devastated. I felt like people were thinking I was hysterical or overreacting, and I knew I wasn't. We just didn't know what it was. Desperate to find out what's wrong, Helen and Anne decide to take matters into their own hands. I worked at a medical college laboratory that did advanced testing on blood. They were doing a clotting test that was beyond what the ordinary laboratory ran. And Julia had not yet had that test. The very next day, they bring Julia to the medical lab so Anne's co-workers can administer the test. The results showed that Julia's platelets did not work correctly. That test wasn't specific about what exactly was wrong with Julia, but at least we knew we were on the right track. We were in a desperate search for a pediatric hematologist who knew something about what was going on with Julia. We were referred at that time to Dr. Lightsey, who was in the pediatric hematology clinic. Within hours, Alan has set up an appointment with Dr. Alton Lightsey. I first met uh, Julia when she was six months old. There were certainly bruises at various stages. I have not seen a patient that young with those symptoms. In the past, the multiple blood tests performed on Julia were within normal limits, and that included a, a platelet count, which was normal. Eventually, the test to look at how platelets work, that was clearly abnormal. And so we finally had something to point at as the cause for the problem. With this information, we had a hunch what we were dealing with. And I wanted to do one last blood test to try to confirm that diagnosis. Waiting for the results felt like forever. I was looking forward to having some kind of relief. And it did take about 10 days before we got our answers. When we received the results from the special test, it documented that uh, Julia had Glansman's thrombosthenia. Glansman's thrombosthenia is a rare genetic blood disorder. In healthy individuals, proteins on the surface of platelets allow them to link together and coagulate. But in patients like Julia, these proteins are missing or malfunction. As a result, platelets slide off one another and aren't able to form a solid clot. If a person cuts themselves and starts bleeding, the platelet has to go to the injured tissue and it sticks to the tissue. And this is where the problem is for Glansman's thrombocenia. Platelets can adhere. You cannot form a solid clot. And that's why you continue to have bleeding or exaggerated bruising. Helen and I were elated when we finally had a diagnosis uh, for Julia. It was a relief to know that all of the symptoms that Julia had had a, a logical explanation. In retrospect, reviewing the case, all of Julia's early symptoms were related to the Glansman's thrombosthenia. During delivery, there is significant trauma, and basically you can have bruising in a perfectly healthy child. In her situation, she had exaggeration of these bruises, and this all suggested that she had uh, an underlying bleeding problem. And the normal bumps and bruises of daily life were too much for Julia's platelets to handle. We just take for granted how our body is able to uh, respond to any kind of minor injury. Even when you walk around, you can actually uh, stretch tissues and cut a vessel. What happens is you get a little bit of blood, 
that goes out into the tissues, that breaks down, and that's where you get the discoloration from, for a bruise. But patients like Julia aren't only susceptible to extreme bruising. They tend to bleed profusely, even from small cuts. He told us how she bled that much from just a little teeny tiny fingernail cut on her face. What had happened was that Julia had scratched her face, and because these platelets weren't able to work well, they just continued to ooze throughout the night. As terrifying as that episode was, it didn't represent the real threat to Julia's health. Unfortunately, in a situation where you have an abnormality like Glansman's, the greatest risk is internal bleeding. It is the nosebleeds, the GI bleeds, that you cannot treat directly, that are the life-threatening bleeds because you cannot stop them. As scary as it was to get the diagnosis, it was also good to know that now we knew what we were fighting. We just wanted to know what this meant to Julia. Helen and Alan Smith have just found out what's been causing their newborn daughter, Julia, to experience harrowing bouts of bruising and bleeding. Glansman's thrombosthenia, an extremely rare blood clotting disorder. Now they're desperate to know what they can do to get the disease under control. Unfortunately, there really is not a cure and there's no medication that can correct this abnormality. We try to use a lot of preventive approaches to try to minimize the chance of the child having bleeding episodes. The only thing we really could do was keep her in a safe environment, make sure that Julia never participated in contact sports. Besides placing a limit on her physical activities, when Julia reaches puberty, she will need medication to keep her from menstruating. Lansman's would really put you at a significant risk to have significant period bleeding to the point that you could die. Just even beginning a cycle could set off a, a bleed that, that would be hard to ever get under control again. There are hormonal uh, medications that can be utilized to control the bleeding. It'll be like the equivalent of taking anywhere from four to eight birth control pills a day, every day, for the rest of her life. While they will be able to keep the risks associated with menstruation in check, the Smiths must now face a devastating truth. Certainly in a pregnancy, the bleeding that occurs postpartum can be very life-threatening. And so uh, it is recommended that Julia not have children. At this point, I was scared out of my mind. But Dr. Leitze uh, was extremely optimistic and reassuring that she could live a long and healthy life. Uh, but it would require uh, work and attention on our part. As they prepare to face the challenges ahead, Helen and Alan can't help but wonder why so many medical experts fail to identify the dangerous disease. Well, there are less than a thousand cases in the world. It's a very uncommon condition and a lot of doctors have never seen this diagnosis. Today, Julia is 11 years old. And while she continues to bruise easily, she's living a very full and miraculously active life. Although I have glansmans, I, I don't let it hold me down. I love to ride my scooter a lot, but I usually have to wear my helmet. We've really made an effort to allow Julia to experience those things that she wants to experience within reason uh, and kept her abreast of everything to do with her disorder. She can live a happy life. She'll never be normal, but she can be pretty close to normal. I grew up, I still want to be a mom. Although I can't have a baby, I would like to adopt one so I could have a child and so that um, that child would have a home. Julia's the strongest person I know. I don't know too many people that could go through the things that she goes through and um, come out as good as she has. She's a fighter.